We're live, Origins 2018. I'm here with Mark Swanson. I'm Nick from Carpenter Reality. Good. He uh, is the designer of Funa. Uh, he's with Oddbird Games. Uh, Mark, could you give a quick overview of what Funa is? Yes, I can. Well, you, the theme of the game is that you've been banished from your homeland and you're thrust into this strange world where you have to reinvent yourself and reclaim your honor. Uh, some of the uh, mechanics in the game include action programming, area control, and what I like to call uh, worker placement with consequences. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Udom is a giant and sprawling board game. How difficult is the playtesting phase of this game? Uh, I wouldn't call it difficult, I'd call it uh, fun, arduous, but fun. Uh, I, I really wanted to emphasize playtesting because in order to create a game that's truly balanced with real multiple paths to victory, you have to make sure that there's not one you know, way to win it. Because uh, um, I think that you know, when people reverse engineer a game, uh, they, uh, it takes the mystery out of it. I remember when uh, some folks had discovered the right buildings to buy in Puerto Rico okay. and uh, there was like a way to optimize a win and I thought oh man that's that kind of sucks because you know it takes some of the, the, the mystery out of the game so I think that through you know many many months of playtesting uh, there are really truly multiple paths to victory and not one single way to win it. Very cool so speaking of different paths to victory is there like a unique strategy that you've seen arise in development that well, one of the things that we did in playtesting was I told people or I tasked people with trying to break the game. And so a lot of my friends are, are pretty, uh, <laughs> they, they came up with some very unique things to do in the game. Like uh, just completely go crazy farming and, and have, have you know four or five farms with lots of resources to try to deplete the uh, haversack of all the resources. Uh, so that was an interesting thing to watch, and I actually had to tweak some of the rules to prevent some weird things from happening. Um, but I think one of the most unique strategies, I think, is um, initially people tend to want to be the ruler of all the locations and have a giant uh, a kingdom and, and uh, be in all of the guilds. But you can also win this game by being a lowly surf and tending landscapes. So I think a landscape strategy is quite unique. Uh, because you know you're not ruling, you're kind of winning from underneath. Which I actually love that design choice. Uh, I feel like a lot of games like this are just going to focus on the combat and the area control and the surf, is, the surf strategy is the complete opposite. Right? Yeah. That's right. That's very cool. So, uh, how was your professional experience in advertising and copywriting? How has that affected things? Or the publishing process? Sure, sure. Well, I think, uh, you know, advertising is certainly helpful, and, and me being a professor of advertising is helpful. But I think that thing, the ga games, uh, or anything, really, that um, ha have some substance uh, will eventually kind of find their way to the top. Uh, eventually, word will get out, and, uh, you know, word of mouth, uh, and, and things that go viral, uh, they, they kind of uh, bring things of value to, to the top. So, adver certainly, advertising is a plus. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and maximizing social media and figuring out which digital display uh, places were the best to, to advertise. All that was important, but I, I think that, I think that um, uh, the influencers, the vloggers, the podcasters out there doing their thing, I think uh, befriending those people and uh, getting them excited about it and really leveraging your community on social media is the way is the, is the real pathway to introduce the game to people. I concur with that. I, I feel like the board game community is still this small community. It's really close. And I think building those relationships with different content creators like us is a great idea. I, I agree. Not only domestically, internationally. Yeah. Um, you know, once you, I, I've had the benefit of having some success on two Kickstarter campaigns. And what's uh, neat about that is sometimes you get, you get approached by foreign publishers. And so, uh, I've gotten to work with uh, 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 the, the, uh, some Russians in, uh, uh, on Tabletopia, uh, which is a multi-platform, browser-based uh, uh, 3D gaming environment. Uh, Tabletop uh, Simulator uh, uh, has a Steam DLC that they're about to release for the game. And so you're, I'm working with folks domestically, but also internationally. Uh, Maldito Games, uh, Morox Pro, uh, Ludify uh, from Brazil, 
um, uh, Genos Games from Italy, so it's, it's been uh, quite an experience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's also a lot of expansions that come with this game or that you can purchase separately, yes. maybe. Yes. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point yet where we wanted to throw them in. I'm three plays in, but once we get there, what expansion do you recommend trying first? Or what's your favorite expansion? Sure. Well, if you want. If you want a truly epic game, Windmills and Catapults allows you to play with a sixth player. And so there's you know, quite a bit of congestion on the board and a lot of intrigue because you're, you're right up against other players, which gives you more conquer uh, options. Um, and then, of course, uh, people tend to buy more vessels so that they can you know, have some breathing room. Right. So that's kind of fun. Uh, so I would recommend Windmills and Catapults. Seals and Sirens, if you like the concept of monsters, the siren is actually a, a monster. She tries to lure you in with her gaze and pin you uh, so that you can't move. Uh, that's kind of fun. Um, and then, of course, Alter Ego uh, allows you to customize your deck before the game even begins. So if you want some variants, uh, after you've played many times, that, that gives you that option. I guess I've just recommended all three of my expansions. <laughs> Alter Ego has really, uh, that's the one I think I'm all of them after I've read through them that's caught my attention. But I feel like when I throw that in, it needs to be with experienced players. Absolutely. So they know how to deck them. I love that option. There's plenty uh, to do with the base game. Yeah. Uh, but once you feel like you've, you've mastered it and understand it, the expansions are were designed with to just provide a little bit of nuance, a little bit of flavor. Not a lot of extra complex rules, but just a little twist. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so when you started looking for an artist, did you have this design aesthetic in mind? I, I find this to be a very beautiful game. I've always loved uh, the art movement expressionism. One of my favorite artists is Bernard Buffet. He's a French expressionist painter. And uh, a lot of his paintings featured thick black lines and etchings and muted color schemes. And so when I saw uh, my work from my artist, it was actually I saw a poster on the, on the wall of an ice cream shop for a, a band. And I thought, that's, that's my artist. And so I contacted him out of the blue. I said, you don't know me, but I'm inventing this game. I love your artwork. Would you like to partner? And to my surprise, he said, I would love to be a part of that. That's really cool. Uh, so he's never done board game. He, he has. A, this is his first board game design. So you know he has played board games before. He's familiar with iconography okay. uh, of other games and how that works into it. Uh, so you know he. he uh, but he, but he, he cut his teeth on on Feudum, and uh, um, he also was a, like me an Adventure Time fan. A lot of people notice some of the charm and the whimsy of the game uh, that lures people in, but. But I think upon closer inspection, uh, there's a little bit of irony because here, while you have kind of this superficially charming game, yeah. it's a heavy hero. And it's, it's mean. There's a lot of player conflict in it. Yeah, I would say a lot. Uh, I think you're rewarded for only three uh, combat actions throughout the game, so there's a point of diminishing returns on direct conflict, but there's certainly a lot of indirect conflict. Yes, that's correct. There's a lot of indirect. Uh, so, going off of iconography that you mentioned earlier, what was the, what was the design choice for having a lot of the iconography being melted into the art on the game? I've not seen a lot of board games do that, and I found it to be a very different approach. Right, right. When you say melted in, you're talking about uh, hard to see? Uh, no, or, no. I don't find it hard to see oh. because I know what to look for, right. but immediately looking at this, I'm not going to think like, you know, the waves and the bubbles true. are part of it so, until you read the rules. So that's a great question because when you're approaching a board game, you have to marry form and function, right? And sometimes function uh, can supersede uh, form in some people's eyes. We tried to find a, a balance. You know, I, I think that my artist uh, and I compromised on a few on a few things. I always wanted the icons a little bit bigger, and he said, "How about just a little bit smaller, uh, so that it blends with the artwork?" Uh, but we tried to provide enough contrast with the iconography and the art of the game so that it was visible but still aesthetically pleasing. I've personally found it a very immersive experience with the way the art is and the iconography sort of melt together and meld together in a way that it's to me I don't find it hard to see because I played the game and I didn't know but I understand. I've heard other people say the opposite. I love it. I think it's a really good design choice. Um, as far as the behemoth, I'm finding it to be a very iconic uh, little meeple or whatever, or miniature, however you want to 
say. Have you ever named it? I actually have. At the, at the back of the rule book, there's actually a narrative okay. where you can learn about all of the characters, the farmer, alchemist, merchant, knight, noble, and the monk, as well as uh, King David. It's actually King David, or Dan, I'm sorry, King Daniel's dominion. And King Daniel is actually married to the, to the queen. And what you find out through this backstory is that the queen stole the alchemy formula from the alchemist and tested it out on her pet snake. And to her delight, the pet snake solidified into gold. And so she took her husband on a royal cruise and spiked his goblet with this alchemy formula. But unbeknownst to her and everyone else, the formula was not complete. So after she discarded her you know, solid gold uh, snake and king, uh, in an abandoned barn loft, they emerged from their gilded cocoons and morphed into these unholy creations. And so the, the, behemoth, the behemoth is actually the king. Uh, and so it's actually kind of a tragic story. I love that. I'm actually going to have to go back and read it now. Yes. I think I remember seeing it in there when I got to the end of the rule book. I just haven't taken the time to read it now. I, I love that you put the effort into the like creating this whole world. It, it speaks to the passion that you have for this game. Yes, absolutely. This is a, a passion project that has spanned uh, close to seven years, uh, five years in development and, and uh, quite a long time in playtesting. Uh, so it's nice to see it come to fruition. It shows, for sure. Uh, so what board games design or uh, inspired the design for you? Sure, great question. Well, uh, I've been playing board games for you know the last 15 years. And uh, one of the, one of my favorite kind of old timer games is uh, Maharaja. Okay. Uh, the action programming in that game inspired me to do action programming in this. Uh, another game, obviously, Puerto Rico. Was, I think it was on number one on Board Game Geek for five years in a row. Uh, the unique uh, uh, roles, the privileges that each character had, inspired me to have uh, unique abilities for each of the characters. Uh, El Grande, if you remember that one, uh, was a great area control game with influence, where you're you know uh, vying for influence in various regions. That kind of plays into this a little bit. But like with any game, you know you want to try to introduce a uh, unique mechanic. And in this game, there is an economic ecosystem, a symbiotic relationship between guild members. Uh, where there's actually a working economy that I've introduced that I think is fairly unique. Uh, it's, it's, what, it's what drove me to invent the game. I've uh, always been searching for the holy grail of games. I never found it, so I, I had the audacity to try to invent it. I hope I've, been, I, I've come close. I, I, I know that I still enjoy the game after more than 100 plays. Uh, so there definitely is uh, new things to uncover and new strategies to explore. So, <laughs> Absolutely. So speaking of the guilds, it's definitely this breathing, living and breathing economy where I've noticed in my plays, and I'm sure this is how it's meant to be designed, if my friend is the guild master in the merchant guild, but he's not pushing goods into the alchemist guild, then the alchemist is sort of like there's a bottleneck here. And sometimes it encourages him because he gets victory points by doing it, but in the same time it's helping other people by stimulating the economy in a really interesting way. Correct, correct. Actually, uh, some people can strategically thwart uh, guild rotation. Um, you're actually uh, trying to stifle it because you don't want to, say, for instance, create uh, uh, influence markers or allow for influence markers to appear in the night guild. However, uh, the, the, the guild card special ability has a feast action that allows other players to throw you a feast and take over your guild powers while you're incapacitated, uh, so you can actually force the issue, and that provides, and then you, they score lots of points for it, so there's actually a built-in incentive for you to go ahead and perform your dutiful role as a guild master, or help other players. Yeah, especially like before somebody does the feast action, it steals your victory points basically for that action. Correct. For sure. So, you're on a desert island, you have three other people stranded with you, what more game do you have with you? Well, lately, uh, I love Caverna, I love uh, Rosenberg, anything that Rosenberg has done, uh, Lahav and Agricola, Caverna, uh, and the, there's a new one out too as well. Um, I'd have that one. Uh, probably Terra Mystica, uh, Zulkin, do I only get three? Uh, however many you want. Oh, okay. How about two more? You got two more. Uh, how about... 
maybe through the ages because they're going to be on the island for a right. long time. Yeah, you have plenty of time to play. And, then, and a few of them, of course. There you go. Excellent. I love that selection. Terry Mystic is definitely my favorite of ours as well, so I agree with that choice. All right, uh, so now that Udom is in the wilds, and it's reaching backers on Kickstarter and people get it on retail. Are you working on anything else? I am. In fact, I mentioned Rosenberg earlier. Uh, I, I'm working on a worker placement game. Okay. Uh, but it's worker placement with a twist. Uh, and I think that people will appreciate it. Uh, I will say that it is uh, a game that's going to uh, uh, take place in the late 1800s in, uh, in North America, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And it involves an economy. Um, I really like games that were involving resource management and economies. Uh, and that's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> You're speaking to me on that. I like the idea of economies. That's what I'm looking for in games, too. Uh, you don't have any sort of head time span. Uh, well, because I emphasize playtesting so much, I, I hesitate to, to predict. Uh, it's just going to really depend on, on how, how how thoroughly I playtest it. So, do you think this will be a Kickstarter as well? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Kickstarter is a so, wonderful platform. Yeah. It's the you know democratization of, of venture capital, allowing uh, you know uh, backers to. Uh, pre-order the game and essentially give you the money you need that manufacture the game is a wonderful uh, system that allows entrepreneurs to realize their dreams. Alright, uh, thank you for your time, Mark. Much appreciated. Thank you, Nick. I'm Nick from Cardboard Reality. Uh, check out our podcast if you haven't. Our review for Feudum is out, so if you want to hear our thoughts on it, uh, feel free to check that out. Mark, is there any last things you want to say? Uh, go Argentina, go Messi, go Iceland. Alright, that's good. Thanks, Mark.